Taking up space with Black Art House, Black artists telling their stories. Allow me to introduce to you Harold Smith. First meeting, um, I was blown away and I received a lot of feedback, Harold, a lot of feedback from young Black men and men, uh, millennials, who was like, that was much appreciated. I, I have a, a larger appreciation for Black art. I'm going to dive in further. Thank you for sending the video. So I was like, oh, and it was like an overwhelming response mm -hmm. um, from those in my network who, I, you know, I don't know how much they know about Black art and, and Black artists across the world. So it was just so nice that I've gotten a chance to connect you to them um, and connect your stories to some of their stories and their, and their fathers and grandparents grandfather's stories and, and friends oh, so mm -hmm. we're gonna walk right down memory lane mm -hmm. a little bit kind of get us right where we left off at and something that stood out to me was you sharing I'm not a traditional painter I wasn't a traditional artist I didn't go to school for art um my question for you is when did you uh pick up your first paintbrush or you, and get your first canvas and mm -hmm. that kind of thing when was that for you well my, my earliest painting memory mm -hmm. Uh, is when I was like, I think it was kindergarten at Abbott Elementary School. And what I do remember is they got us these uh, plastic easels, I think, and a big mm -hmm. paper. I know it was big paper and I had green paint. I'm sure it was tempera. And I were, what I do remember though, is I, I wanted to draw a ball on there and I just kept going around and around to the whole, I remember somebody asking me, I think it was the teacher, what is it? And I was like, it's a ball, but it's like, it's yeah. almost a whole paper. And then, right. then yeah, the whole paper was green when I was done. So that was it. <laughs> but <laughs> I do have a lot of Crayola drawings I did back then, though. Yeah. And they're similar, similar themes, people, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And what drew you to people? I know when sometimes when, when young budding artists are encouraged to draw, it's not always a people. It's of things, it's of images they see out in the world. Really, do they go... Now, draw me something of someone. Not always right. do I hear that, um, even with the coloring books, although there's tons of faces, many kids may not connect, especially Black children may not connect to the faces that look like theirs. So they'll go to the landscape, you know, doing the buildings, the bikes, the balls, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What drew you to people in particular? What about oh, people? Um, um, I think I started drawing, well, I do, I remember. I started drawing more people probably in junior high, high school. Okay. Before that, it was bugs. I had a whole comic book series of ants yeah. fighting. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, the covers and everything. I was really back at the pro wrestling back then, too. And I would actually, it sounds weird, but, you know, in the front of our house, there was a tree that had all these black carpenter ants, big old ants. And yeah. I just, I would grab them by the antennas, you know, swing them around until they got, what's that word? Um, oh, agitated, gosh. then drop them okay. together. And, they start fighting until one of them bit the other's head off. Oh my so, goodness. <laughs> you were so, creative with it. <laughs> yeah. Just hope I hope I don't get an email from what people for the ethical treatment of insects. But right. <laughs> I, I, did experiment. I did some Frankenstein stuff. I tried freezing them in an ice cube and thawing <laughs> them out. See if they take the take wires and put them on the little nine volt batteries, touch it to their antennas and try to oh revive goodness. them. And <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy just <laughs> yeah weird. actually this funny thing though is uh when i was a senior in high school i remember i took the act and i hadn't planned on taking it because i hadn't mm -hmm. even thought about college oh, wow. and i yeah. got the, i got the highest composite score in the school uh out of 1600 kids and then wow. uh believe it or not i tied a guy for the highest score in sciences for the state oh wow Wow. Yeah, me, me and another guy had a perfect like 30 or 35 or whatever it was in science. Yeah. Oh, and I wow. Was, I was big into that. I won some as a kid. I was in science fairs all the time. I had the science kid and the microscope. And but mm -hmm. and then I got into people, drawing people. I remember that. I did that a, a lot in middle school. Yeah. So, yeah. That's so interesting. I wonder if that's the time in which you kind of discover more of you. So the interest of other people becomes... Right. You know, you're more likely to kind of go, well, what about the other people that I see on the other end of me? Are Who are they? Kansas City? And kind of, yes, ma'am. From... Okay. And your family as well? Are you all from Yes. Well, just me and my sister left now. But yeah, we're from Kansas City. My parents, okay. oh, okay. My mom was from Kaplan, Louisiana. And my dad was from Freight for Kansas. Okay. And his family was a part of the Exodusters. 
who came from like the Exodusters were the, uh, former slaves mm-hmm. that moved to the Kansas. They just they just had to get out of a Confederate former Confederate state. Okay. So they came from Kentucky through Missouri and it just settled in Kansas. It had been a free state. OK. And, and uh, so they settled. believe it or not, when I think about it, from Frankfort, Kentucky to Frankfort, Kansas. And mm. uh, so they were mm-hmm. ex, they're called exodusters. They were uh, kind of like the a, a precursor of the Great Migration. Yeah. Right. She was from Kaplan. So, yeah, she's probably more Creole than black, actually. Very. OK. I was going to ask you, what was it like growing up now learning more about your parents background? What was it like growing up in Kansas City? Um, something for your mom, who was originally from Louisiana, which I'm sure is very different. Exactly. <laughs> you know, this is her upbringing. What was that like having those different um, cultures kind of in one space in, in the rearing of Harold? <laughs> well, yeah, um, we, we had gumbo. We had a lot of gumbo. And I do remember going down to the South when I was a child mm-hmm. uh, for a trip. In fact, I got some old movies, believe it or not, that I had converted to digital. Okay. And in this movie, I'm probably like three years old, but we're visiting Kaplan, Louisiana. And I mean, I had a cousin that didn't even have a name. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, we, wow. went there, okay. we, went to, we went there later again when I was like 12 or 13, I think, 11 or, it had been 1973, 70, okay. 72 or 73. Okay. But yeah, because back, back where they were in Kaplan, I mean, people weren't, were still being born in homes. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, your birth certificate was at the church parish. It wasn't at okay. the courthouse. Like when my mom retired, she had to go down to Louisiana to track down a birth certificate because there wasn't one. Right. Uh, right. but, but I do remember, uh, they called her sister as a cousin. <laughs> they just named her sister and that was it. Uh, and they would have the open air, you know, the, the sewer or whatever things would be like open out in front of the houses, all down the streets, the sewage, yeah. where you flush your toilet, go out and the, the, okay. I don't know, the, whatever they call it, the water thing, but yeah. So nothing but insects. A, I mean, you got that open, open waste <laughs> coming through there. Just nothing but insects. Right. Uh, right. And at night afternoon, the truck would come down with smoke and blow smoke out to try to beat some of them back. The houses were, were up on, uh, built up on bricks because of flooding. Yeah. It's all this yeah. different from Kansas City, but one of the most right. har- one of the most harrowing things I saw. We went to somebody's house to visit. Uh uh-uh. okay. <laughs> and I looked in the corner and it's like all you know, you don't see any crown molding in the house except this okay. one corner you have this thick black crown molding going up and down. Yes. So I'm looking, okay. but it looked like it was moving. Like what the you know, I'm kid. <laughs> and you're kid, was, you know. <laughs> mind but believe it or not, this was roaches going up and down so closely packed that from the distance it looked like black. Okay. And these oh are big roaches. You, if you've been down in the south, you know you got them roaches like that that fly, they bite. Yeah. And I was when oh, I was in the, when I was in the in Caribbean as a missionary. They, yeah, man, you they, these ain't these ain't Kansas City roaches, you know. These right. Things. Right. So, so she grew up, you know. There, my dad on the other hand, see, my mother only had a sixth grade education. Okay. My dad on the other hand, it went to Frankfurt High School and he graduated. I still got mm-hmm. his letter, but the thing is. He uh, was an all-state tackle in high mm-hmm. school. This is the late 30s. And he remembers a coach coming to see him from Northwestern. And everything was fine until he found out he was black. Yeah. But he stayed for the game and just basically told him, if you were not a Negro, you could play for any college in an age. But then, you know, as you get older, you can right. realize the, the amount of hurt that must have uh must have caused. Must have caused they, were, they were farm people, so they didn't. Okay. They didn't uh, know about like HBCUs and and all of that. And and the truth be told, I mean, when I came out of high school, they never talked to me about college. And my dad was kind of pissed off that I went, to be honest with you. I was kind of angry that I went. But then, you know, for a while there, he just didn't have a whole lot to say to me. And then just later in life after my mother passed and we talked and by this time he's older and but i under, i understand it now right because you would think that if you had all this potential and, and all your opportunities were denied you yeah that yeah you're going to be happy that your child gets it but i can understand how you would feel a little bit miffed yeah. like why, why couldn't that have been me or right 
this, you know. I, I you know. wonder if, Harold, let me know if you think of this, like, if it's one of those things where if you haven't walked the path, it, it, there is a certain level of fear that's on the other end of that for many yeah. black families who kind of let their children go on yeah. uh, into an unknown yeah. world. It's like, yeah. yeah. And I remember I mentioned, I was in college about I was t- taking an economics class. I mentioned about buying some stocks. And, that's for rich people. That's for rich people. That's for yeah. rich people. And just never stopped to, but probably just never understood. I'm, I think, I think part of, uh, you know, Carrie James Marshall once talked about the burden of blackness and how a lot of artists don't have that. And I think a, a lot of us who were raised, Post civil rights generate. Well, we're still in civil, but the post sixties are, are in that area. You know, we don't have that burden of the crushing blackness that our ancestors grew up with. Mm. You know, growing okay. up in that, I'm sure it, you know it impacted him. I'm sure it impacted my mom. I even even even, even as I'm working on some art now, I think about a lot of the older black men I knew in my childhood that grew up around and that they passed on. There was this. I don't know, resignation to mm-hmm. life. Because now when they talk about re- retirement, you see these, these uh, ads and videos and for fest- and they show that everybody's all happy and vibrant. And we're going to retire and we're going to travel right. the world. The vast right. majority of older black men and women I grew up with have been so broken. And I do wonder sometimes if my parents had some degree of that and for me to want to do something outside of just getting a job studies have been done on, on how the society affects the black mind i want to tap into because you're right where like you're right where i'm like oh i want to know this mm-hmm. um as you speak of your relationship with your father yeah. i know you mentioned you also have a son um i wanted you if you don't mind just describing uh-huh. um Maybe the, not the difference per se, but maybe uh, the parallels to your father and his rearing as opposed to yours and how that mm-hmm. how that affected your son. Um, he got to see you in all these different layers that was mm-hmm. his dad. Um, not many black men of today, right. they, they can't recall the layers of their father. They might remember right. some moments, some times he worked, he came home. Right. Um, but what was, has that journey been like thus far? as it well, parallels to what you remember. Okay, well, um, I remember my grandfather vaguely and grandmother on my m- father's side, but by the time my son was born, both my parents were deceased. Okay. Uh, so I was a single father. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm a certified teacher, no criminal record, none of that, none mm-hmm. of it at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Outstanding yeah. citizen. All mm-hmm, of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so after my son was born, you know, my son's mother and I disagreed and she decided you're not going to see him. So I went to court, but it took almost a year of going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and yeah. forth for a court to just enforce my visitation mm-hmm. rights. Next judge we got was Lisa Hardwick, a black female judge. We only had to go in front of her once. Fatherhood for black men is, is it, now that was something different because my father didn't have to go through that because he right. was married to my mom and all that. There, I tried to be a, a good father to my own son, a better father than my father was to me, and I believe mm-hmm. I was. The yeah. burden of blackness is tough on black males. And so even from early years, there are things we must speak on to our boys and experiences we must speak about too. Right. Uh, One Sunday, I bought my son a bicycle and took him to the public library to learn how to ride it. And my son was probably seven or eight at the time. As we were leaving, a police car pulled up and asked all sorts of questions about the bicycle. It seemed that some well-meaning white person saw a black man and a son putting a bicycle in the trunk of his car and thought that was suspicious, that the bike Mm. was stolen, even though my son had a bike helmet on. Then finally, I told the police, listen, you got my license plate number. Obviously, if someone reports Mm. a stolen bicycle like this one, I got the receipt for, come to my house and get it and just left. But and so we had to talk about that. You know, my son had to talk about that. And then years later, now this is deep. When Obama ran for president in 08, my son was like 10 or around 10. We went to a Walmart and I had on my Obama shirt and this white couple walked by and gave me just this utterly, this mm-hmm. utter look of disgust and anger. Some call it a white, I, some say a white gaze, I'll say a demonic gaze. Right. And my son was like, why are they so mad at you? Did, did you do something? These people know you? No. And so you have to have that conversation. 
So it's different. There are conversations that we have to have with our black children uh, when the police stop you. White folks don't have to tell their kids how to act if you you get falsely accused. How does you as an artist, I mean, to watch your your Mm -hmm. son kind of see you there, right? And see you begin to, again, create little brown, you know, brown boys who look like him, what was that feeling like? When we, when he was little, like most kids, he was really into it, wanted to paint just the way I painted all that. Then as he got to be a teenager, did you sell anything, you know, became more about the money. Okay. (laughs) And then now it's just more about, okay, that's just what you do. I mean, that's just it. It's not like it's just like, yeah, some guys do this, some guys play pool. My dad paints, you know, he went in the military, he served in the air force, got out. Then he was a programmer for a while. Well, he was a military contractor okay. for a while. And then he was a program. Well, that's what he was a con. Now he's driving a truck. So okay. uh, he doesn't, even though I mentioned it, he used to love photography. I've mentioned it. I still got one of your cameras around here. <laughs> right. Now, my mother, she took a ton of paintings. I mean, pictures. I oh. got that tub of photographs, some of them going all the way back to the 40s. Wow. And I scanned some of them in. I've always thought about scanning all of them in. So she seemed to have an artistic interest, but other than that. And what would she take pictures of, if you don't mind me asking? What were some of her oh, interests? Just family respect. gathering. My life okay. was a lot different from my friends, which have, which may have pushed me to spend more time in my art. My okay. mother had, um, she has serious and untreated emotional illness. Okay. Um, so it was a lot like, you know, yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty bad. Okay. So as soon as my sister got old enough to do sleepovers with her high school friends, she was just gone most of the time. You know, in all honesty, it was not a nourishing, nurturing, or caring environment. Right. Uh, I don't have no memories of you know being hugged, being told I was loved. None of that. Right. Um, so you know, often when you hear of black, you know, when you hear people talk about the baby boy syndrome, because I just had the total polar opposite experience. Right. Uh, it was totally opposite and so I may be I think I was a little bit you know in high school one you know love and all of that I think it's because they came from homes where they saw it so they wanted it in their lives right. I didn't see it so right I was just um had some part-time jobs watched a lot of movies did a lot of painting my father now he, he worked multiple jobs he had a regular job at a car dealership but he also worked, worked tons of overtime mm-hmm. and took on jobs cleaning buildings in the evening and I grew up kind of with this romanticized notion that he was gone all the time so we could have nice things. But as I got older, it became pretty obvious he just didn't want to be around all the drama and trauma. I was a little angry at him for a while about that because I felt he should have done more to protect mm-hmm. us. I think, of course, like with most people of that time, I think a lot of those issues, his stoicness probably came from... Uh, all the stuff that had happened in his life. And then my mother, after she died, uh, her sister flew up here from, um, where did she want From Texas for the funeral. My, her aunt, Juan, my aunt Juanita, my mom's sister. Uh, Juanita, we sitting on the front porch and then I, and you know, this is, this goes back to the thing of black people not being open about issues and mental health issues and not dealing, you know, she's sitting out there and she's saying, you know, when Margaret was a child, we would take her to grade school and she would just start screaming in the middle of the school day, just start screaming. Mm-hmm. And we'd take her home and then come back to school. And finally she did it. And the teacher said, don't bring her back anymore. Oh. So we would get our lesson at school and go home and tell her. And that's why she didn't finish. That's all she got finish. done was sixth grade. Right. Yeah. Sixth, right. That explains and it, it. Yeah. And you know, it sounds sort of like something out of a movie, you know, where somebody, you know, has passed and then you're sitting out there afterwards and all these come out. But the truth is, that stuff should have come out before, not to shame anybody, but so that her own kids wouldn't be traumatized. Some of these things that are a part of blackness, uh, some of the secret secretiveness that we have sometimes mm-hmm. amongst mm-hmm. things where we're not like dealing with stuff. Right. I mean, not not to bring this guy. Well, yeah, there's there's a famous musician that recently got convicted of all these horrible sex crimes. And the sad thing is somebody should have pulled that dude aside 30 years ago when they saw the first going that way and say, hey, right. man, if he had if he had done something, then you got to out him. If not, maybe get treatment. And I think some of this protective nature we got is because of what we go through. Right. I mean, let's be honest. I remember when O.J. Simpson was on trial. 
Mm-hmm. You go in public, yeah, they framing the Jews. They out for the Jews. You go in a black barber shop, it's a different story. They're like, well, yeah, I mean, I'm out there champ, but <laughs> I know he did it. You know, there's that di- so there is that whole dynamic yeah. of how blackness affects the black family and the black yeah. people. This is and, not on any mm-hmm. question I've given you, so forgive mm-hmm. me if I am this off the beaten path. When I first learned of your work and I began to to truly look at it, like truly take my time um, and look at the details of your work, I noticed that there was a certain sadness to the eyes of this particular man. I wasn't sure of the age of the gentleman, but there was a sadness behind the eyes. I wonder what this person's looking at. I wonder what moment in time, I'll be honest, in my own experience, I don't often see joy that paint that's on a man, on a black man's face. Certain sadness that that overshadows them. Rather it's thought, rather it's just life. Um, and you know, it takes maybe the joy of something else to cause joy within themselves. And then but, the color, right? Like once I, I zoomed in on the eyes and then the color around it and its richness really forced me to now think of color and the emotions of. Oh, wow. Well. I've had a lot of people say my eyes look sad on my paintings. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've had people tell me in person that they see it when they look at my face. So I don't plan to make the eyes sad. I just go with what feels right at the time, but they always come out the same way. Okay. So it's not like a planned effect, but it's just what I feel. And then it seems like when I'm working on the eyes, I don't stop till they work a certain way and I'm comfortable with them. You know, there's a song by Ice Cube from the Death Certificate album called True to the Game. Mm. And, it, and he takes shots at uh, he takes shots at uh, a Hammer and a few other people. And at the end, and it, <laughs> I think I know the, that. Right, I know that the, song. Yeah, yeah. At the end, and there's a clip in there of, I think, no, it's a, it's a video of Khalid Muhammad speaking at the end. But there's a, a, a line in that song that says, Black folk always got to show their teeth. Now I'm going to be brief. And he took a shot at, you know, the grinning, cheesing, Negro, you know. Mm -hmm. And nothing wrong with smiling and being happy. But I tell you, uh, I think you're right. I don't see that many pictures of black males with a big smile on their face. Uh, Even by work of black artists. Um, Yeah. I know, uh, what's that, Derek Adams is doing the whole thing on the... uh, leisure black leisure Mm -hmm. uh, with these innovative images of black folks enjoying leisure and even in those ones you don't see a lot of big smiles a lot of us are content but i think Mm -hmm. there's we still got too much suspicion you mentioned music you mentioned ice cubes so we're talking oh yeah gangsta rap we're talking west coast we're talking late 80s early 90s we're talking right (laughs) right in the height of where black music began to feel different right Mm -hmm. mc hammer when he took a stab at let's just be honest mc hammer wasn't doing nothing nobody else was doing and them hammer pants was not it was not black culture Uh, and ice cube fell and when he speaks to this day he's very clear about how some of the pain and the struggle that go that went along with his community at the time and how he was answering to that um, right. and speaking from his own experience and the black, his young black men um, mm-hmm. and the criminal justice system. Right. Mm-hmm. And last time we spoke, we mentioned jazz, um, black oh, genre, yeah. black genre. Um, and I feel like b- black men, I'm going to kind of read my thing because I had it all figured out. Black men in every genre have provided us with love, with pain, with struggle and with some hopefulness. In, in their in the work in the body of work that they they put out, um, as you have shared, jazz has played a background in your art and in its inspiration. So, can you continue to share with me a little bit more about black music and its inspiration? Okay. Right. Well, I grew up seventies, uh, so I remember I had the forty five for pill me something good, Rufus yeah. and Shaka Khan. <laughs> I remember, listen, I remember 1974, 73, 76, 76 maybe. The the P-Funk Earth Tour came to Kansas City. Okay. Parliament, Funkadelic, all of them, right? Okay. So I was like 12 or 13. My sister was 16, 17, maybe a little older. And I I, uh, begged to go along with them. So I got a ticket. So this thing starts at, I don't know, 4 or 5 o'clock at Arrowhead Stadium. It was packed. 
Okay. And I was, you know, I was still going to Catholic school at the time. So a lot of stuff I didn't know about. But the funny thing is my, my sister and then basically promised my parents that I would be with them all night. Right. Shoot, as soon as we as soon as we hit Arrowhead, man, they're like, you on your own. We see you out here when the show's over. That thing was 12 hours. Really? I don't think it started at five. I think it started at noon. Oh, yeah, there was. Let's see. There was Rufus with Shaka Khan. Right. The Brothers Johnson played. Rolls Royce played. I remember Rolls Royce. Mm-hmm. Rufus with Shaka Khan. Brothers Johnson. I see Brothers did a long set. I mean, they did <laughs> okay. a whole set. People were talking about I mean, they tore it down. That was back when they had Fight the Power. And right, right. And has come back. That one album they had, it just had everything on it. Then it was Bootsy's Rubber Band. But he's mm-hmm, in it mm-hmm. short. Somebody set off firecrackers on the field. People thought it was shooting. So everybody ran off the field. And the, you know how black folks go to concerts? You know how we dress, right? We dress like we go into church. So there were all these shoes on the field. Oh, my gosh. And people had to go back in their shoes. And then Funkadelic came. They did a whole thing. The, the mothership landed. Oh, wow. Took all, all of that. But it was wild. I went to the bathroom. And I mean, it was like. Uh, the, the 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 weed was just a cloud in there. But the <laughs> P like, Funk Earth Tour, the double LP. I remember I literally used to like come home every day in probably seventh and eighth grade, up into high school. Actually, I take that back. I did this probably till my sophomore year. Listen mm-hmm. to the whole thing every day. Every day. All oh, four wow. sides. All four okay. sides. Okay. I had all the, I had all of the Funkadelic album. I even wrote I wrote a thing about it on Facebook one time, a little story. I don't know if I have. It was an open letter about our struggles, and I had all that. And I remember my mother went through one of her issues one day, and I came home from community college. Yeah. And I walked in the house. Well, I, as I walked up to the house, I could see the trash, the big old barrel we had in the back. Something was burning in it, and I walked in the house, and she just kind of had this smirk on her face. And when I went into my bedroom, I immediately knew all my albums were gone. Comic oh. books were gone. Every She had taken all my stuff and just threw it in the trash and set it oh. on fire. I like jazz, Billie Holiday. Yeah. I, think, I think music inspires my, not just my content, but my technique, yeah. my strokes and color selection. Slow, sensual music may have me feeling the paintbrush over the palette knife, more maybe, because it has a slower, more intimate feel right. than a palette knife. Uh, right now I've been listening to H E R. Her. You see my living room got art everywhere. <laughs> I have art everywhere. <laughs> got more over here. There's the front door. So yeah, uh, I think what I, I like and what I've shared with Black Art House and the community in particular, the art of storytelling is very unique to Black art. Yes, um, to understand the artist, you must understand the stories. You must understand the story, the the, the journey from which they came, the shoes in which they walked in. Um, rather, they were shoes that could fit or wasn't quite yet fitting. Um, black artists have a story to tell. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll take you down another mm-hmm. memory lane and going, can you share what was your first exhibition? Yes. And if you, if you can, what was the theme of that exhibition? It was in 1999 at the Kansas City, Kansas Public Library, not too far from where I live, literally. I didn't really have a theme. I just had some random paintings. Like I had people at a bus stop, a couple sitting on the edge of a bed. Okay. Uh, But I don't have any more of them pieces. Those all all are sold. I would just get on the bus, ride all over the city and sketch people sometimes. Oh, wow. It's fun. It's it's just, yeah, you ain't driving. You just sit there. Different folks get on and off. And Mm -hmm. people do that in New York a lot. A lot. Mm. You ever rode really? the New York subway? I have. Yeah, I've seen people there just mm. sketching arts. Well, just sketching. Could be anybody. I've seen yeah. kids look like they are in art school. One of your latest exhibitions, Can You mm. See Me? Yes. I thought it was such a powerful, so forgive me. I, I think words have so much power that sometimes I have to I have to pull me back to brace myself for what it may mean and what it means to the other person who, who is mm. sharing them with me. Did you title your the exhibition that? And what was that inspiration for the Can You yeah. See Me exhibition? Yeah, my agent, Dwight Smith, I think he's the one that cited on the title. Okay. With with the uh, Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art. Mm-hmm. But it was, it was inspired by my thoughts on the invisibility of Black men in America, mm-hmm. especially those who are not in the public eye. It seems like, you know, mainstream, a lot of America only see, only likes two types of Black men, the ones they can mm-hmm. put in jail 
and point the fingers at and tell their kids don't be like them. Mm -hmm. And then the others, the LeBrons, uh, you know, the athletes, the ones yeah. that they can buy posters of for their kids' walls. Right, uh, right. And, but in both cases, they're not looking at the full humanity of the person. Right. You know, when you take right. a black person who's committed a crime, a violent crime, it's, you know, then you, it's funny, you know, and I got hip to this years ago, but you even in the news, you know, when there's a violent crime taking place and the perpetrators, you can tell the perpetrator's black if they use terms like bestial crime, barbaric, brutality. They throw, yeah. all, the, they throw all the extra in there because they don't see our <laughs> humanity. They don't see our right. humanity anyway. So right. it's easy to just take that and, you know, and then, uh, the Michael Jordans and, and LeBron James's and Obama's, they don't see them as fully, they see them as something of other than human, right. other than just regular flesh and blood human beings. I mean, look at how much heat these guys catch, like LeBron catches when he just simply said some, a few things about protecting black lives. So in the middle, you got a majority of black men who go to work, buy homes, raise those kids, mm -hmm. vote. And those men are invisible to a lot of people. Right, right. But, but even as I was typing this out, I realized something. First of all, thank mm -hmm. God, more and more Black artists are, are, are working on those narratives yeah, of er yeah. average, everyday Black men. However, the invisibility is selective because if you look at the voter suppression laws being passed mm -hmm. all across the South, that's who they're oh, targeting. Yeah. That's who they're targeting. They don't, they don't want them to vote. Working class. Right. They don't right. want them to vote. So we're, we're invisible. Uh, but when, when we're a threat, man, we suddenly are so very, very visible. Mm. I, know you were, I know you were diving into some of the complexities um, of the black man. Yep. Um, share with me more, a little bit more about the invisible man. So the one that is working is, is taking care yep. of children. Um, yep. you mentioned the only time that, that black men are, do become visible is when, you know, yep. when we are on trial, you know, <laughs> when exactly. they are ready to throw away the key. Like, do they see themselves as you described them or that invisible man? Or are they striving to be the LeBrons? You know, is that the struggle in the black man is trying to figure out which side of... I teach school and I know they've often said, oh, black guys just want to be athletes and entertainers, but I've met very few students who aspire to do that. Right. Most of the students I taught, you know, wanted to do things like start a business or go into a computer program, be a chef, right? make movies, hold a business. And some did want, hey, I want to one day take over my mom's nail business or my mom's hair, hair business. Right, right, right. Which is, you know, it's beautiful. I think that what's going on with black men, I think a lot of us are just trying to hang on to embrace our full humanity. Mm -hmm. But realize, but, you know, after seeing things like what happened to George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and just it seems like these little slap on the wrist sentences they give to people. I mean, I mean, it's a lot of things have got, gone on have, I think it's chopped away at a lot of our optimism, a lot of our hopes. Nice. The vast majority really want the same things it seems every other human being wants. They want to live a productive life. They want to have love. They don't want to be alone. They want to do something they're proud of, honorable of. Like myself, many of us grew up in homes damaged by the effects of slavery and racism, but we thrived and found a footing for success. Right. We enjoy right. it, but we also feel a tinge of pain when we think mm. about those older folks we grew up with. And a lot of the younger people won't understand this because people of, you know, young enough to be my children or whatever wouldn't get it. But those of my age whose parents had went through all of that, came back from Korea and Vietnam and World War II yeah. and got mistreated. But anyway, we feel a tinge of pain because we think of those older folks who we grew up with. They kept a smile on their face, a song in their heart, even though their dreams had been gutted by racism and our success. Yeah. At, at a, at a, came at the price of their suffering to a degree. They endured a lot of suffering so right. that we could be successful. We are peaceful. We do what we can within the power structure to make things mm -hmm. work. But we are always cognizant of the fact that the structure can turn on us in a hot second. Right. Despite right. what we do, despite how high we rise, there is always the burden of blackness hovering in the shadows. Yeah. 
We know yeah. the love and joy, but we also know the pain and suffering. Right. We live in a society that will worship us for what we do on the sports field or on the movie screen, but will also demonize us when we dare speak up and, and speak truth to power. It saddens me that there are now, um, we have a generation, generations, I think there's at least two of them so far, who don't get to have these conversations. To, that grandparents are not the same. Our, our Black homes are not built the same. No. Um, the distance that we find our families in play a huge role in some of the pieces that will always be missing from the puzzle that makes up that family, the lineage yep. of that family. Um, so thank you for that. It's like that movie yeah. Soul, Soul Food. You know, you ever watch that and just yes. yeah. imagine what it would have been like to have that every Sunday family gathering. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and, and I, I, you know, I, I think it's <sighs> like you said, that tinge of pain um, the black, the black family, especially those who were torn and broken down uh, to the point where they were stripped, uh, where the black woman, the black man, were no longer <laughs> inseparable. As a matter of fact, they were separate <laughs> yep. uh, very often, and how that played a role in how the children saw themselves within that family unit. Exactly. Um, Conversations like these are not easy to have, but our stories must be told that this space that has been created in Black Art House, this conversation we are having, it is an idea I kind of threw out months ago about taking up space. And I thought art should take up space. Black art should be something that we are shoving it in people's faces every single day because our stories deserve to be told. When I'm having conversation with artists in particular, my goal is to create a safe space for artists to kind of tell those, the stories that may not ever get a chance to see the light of day. They, they really are, they are uh, the secrets to make you who you are. They're the secrets to um, one of your, your, your most infamous pieces on down to the piece that you're still working on. Um, so how are you taking up space today with your art? Uh, how are you taking up space? <laughs> am I taking up space? I think, I yeah. think by God's grace, I think mm -hmm. that um, uh, there are discussions I think it's doing that. I think it's taking up space as by opening doors. I think there's a lot of younger black artists here that have seen my art and it's inspired them to, to try even, you know, go for it, exhibit, show their work. I know a person who had worked for years and their work had only been in their basement about two years ago. Uh, they finally, in their 50s, mm -hmm. showed some work in a local gallery, small gallery. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I think it's uh, thinking of space. I think it's causing people to think, hopefully, discussions, making more mm -hmm. people comfortable with blackness. Yeah. Uh, and and just the black experience um, to allow people to express their truth, their story, even if it involved horrible things done to them right. by your ancestors that mm -hmm. you are benefiting from yeah. today financially, socially, but at the same time, helping you be in a space where you can hear that story without getting defensive and just, and it was sad that that's what happened. I think one of the, you know, when it comes to black art, I think, you know, one of the beauties of it is there's a lot of knee jerk reaction from scared people. A lot of these things we've talked about, voter suppression laws, all this, all that. And then there's just some overt lies pushed out there by right wing media that black people want to take your house and then nah, 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 nah. really they're bringing back that whole vibe of birth of a nation but i think black mm -hmm. art um it expresses the stories artistically it, it it i think it can bring these truths forward in a way that that simply reading about them or telling somebody cannot you know people can engage a painting or a photograph or a sculpture or a film or, or a song without having to discuss it with somebody else. Right. right. So it could be a way for a person to gain a deeper understanding in a less threatening environment than say a, 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 a dinner conversation. It's also, and I've also told this to some people who are white, I said one of the things too, it's a way in which you could, if you, if you consider yourself a progressive individual, consider yourself a non-racist individual for equality, 
what you know one of the ways you start is have a piece of black art in a very prominent space in either your home your business yeah. your office your cubicle and then people come there they, they're going to look at your artwork and automatically that's know what, again that's what helps black art to take up space and black stories to take up space in spaces exactly. where we know we belong we know we belong we just need right. folks to trust including our own people that black art should be showcased in our homes this is a story that's being told of this is the story being um covered i'm often puzzled by that shrine of the black family that was, and there, and there, was also, there was also the, the trifecta everybody had back in the day the jesus the john kennedy and the martin luther king <laughs> it's like a staple in a black home interesting it, I don't know if you, uh, Kerry James Marshall, in one of his works, he actually has that in the background. Does he? Okay. I've, I've seen it done three ways. I've seen Jesus, Martin Luther King, and John F. Kennedy. I've seen Jesus, Robert <laughs> Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. And then I've seen oh. everybody but Jesus, the two Kennedys and with King in the middle. <laughs> and then the, then the fans in church with them on there, too. Remember? Yeah. And yeah. The church fans. That stuff was iconic black, black art does something different where it's forced to help you to understand the story as opposed to other things that are kind of given to you and right. no one needs to say anything and you assume oh this is the this is the black experience yes right. and you go, no no <laughs> not quite <laughs> it's more this right an experience right but not the black experience per se i have the question i think you answered this before but i'm excited to hear you say it one more time um who or what and what would you love to do an art commission for oh wow. and what is your dream exhibition what does that look like for you and how can we as black um black art house kind of help you to get there if i did art commission it'd probably be down to either the studio museum of harlem okay or the uh moad museum of the I african diaspora okay in san francisco now my dream exhibition but yeah my dream exhibition mm -hmm. The, the meal, the spread would be totally different. Okay. Ain't no crackers and cook. Now we having some, 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 <laughs> oh, we having short ribs and I mean, wait, <laughs> man, mac and cheese. I'm trying, yeah. I don't, I don't want to say fried chicken, but yes. Fried chicken will be available. Oh, yes. Man, it'd be <laughs> cornbread, none of that effed up potato salad. <laughs> Real potatoes. Salad. Yeah. I mean, my spread is, it, listen, this is what been my dream. First of all, you had this major spread, just wow. Okay. But then, then around 10 o'clock, have some of them disco balls come down <laughs> and I'll DJ. Really? Okay. We party till about <laughs> two in the morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but what you're describing is a good time. Oh, and I hell think, yeah. uh, you know, black, the black culture, the one thing we do enjoy it in celebration is understanding what a good time looks like and feels like. Yeah, I mean, you know, cause you know, to be honest with you, I, you know, I mean, I'm grateful for all my exhibition opportunities. I'm grateful yeah. for all of them, even public library, wherever I'm, I'm grateful, but yeah, they, it's just so the, the spread, man, and stuff all, that's when it gets so white, so sanitized. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, you know, I mean, it's like, I would like, I said, if I did, I have some food catered in by what's that, the Peachtree Buffet, or better yeah. yet, <laughs> or, or better yet, the, uh, uh, what's that board at the Baptist Church? You know, them ladies, <laughs> man, they is shit. They get down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd be, wow, that, it would be the spread followed by the, the after party. So if I have an opening and I'm in charge, and I got mm -hmm. an unlimited budget, no, it's going to be crunk. Do you have a theme in mind? Oh wow! Theme. Well, probably this. I mean, if I were to do something right now, it'd probably be. I'm, if I did something right now, it's like a some work I'm working on right now. I'm trying to explore my experience as a black man of 58. Yeah. And 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 just yeah, that'd probably be the the theme. But you know, so the the art might get a little heavy. I'm not gonna lie, at my age, you know, I, I do have these moments of what if this had been different? What if that had been different? Yeah. What if I went to art school out of college? What if I had done this? What if I had done that? But, you know, it is what it is. I think that, yeah. uh, you know, DMX, I love DMX. I definitely play some DMX. This song he oh, has called, yeah. there's a song he has called Slippin'. That album alone was a very powerful one. The, the, the Black man's experience as he yes. knew it, um, his story and the story of his. Of the, the men around him. You know, DMX, in my opinion, uh, content-wise, he was really a bluesman. 
No. He was a bluesman. I mean, you I look at that. what I he said, that. it was yeah. just like the blues, just with a different type that. of music. I but it that. said, yeah. he said, see, to live is to suffer, but to survive, well, that's to find meaning in the suffering. Mm. So I think mm. I kind of reached a point where even artistically, I'm just trying to find meaning in things. Mm. I hope there's a meaning. And I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I wonder. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I wonder. It makes me think of what in this a documentary called The Price of the Ticket. One of my of James Ball. But Marlon Riggs was great. Mm -hmm. You know, are you, are you familiar with Marlon Riggs? No. Okay, no, Marlon. Go cheat it. <laughs> yeah, he, cheat it. he was a uh, he was a um, black uh, poet and filmmaker. He died of AIDS in like 1994, okay. but he left. But in his short career, he created these fabulous fabulous documentaries. His last one. I believe it was called I Shall Not Be Moved. He was oh. dying when they made it. And so there are parts of the documentary literally being recorded from his hospital bed. Oh, wow. Our wow. Marlon Riggs, great, phenomenal um, filmmaker. He explored great stuff. And uh, there was a poet at the time he featured called Essex Temple. What I do remember, this is before the internet. So, you know, it wasn't yeah. like you immediately hear, but. But when I was going back all the way back to James Baldwin, he made a quote where he said, I wonder sometimes mm -hmm. about our place in this country. And shoot, I still wonder. I mean, it's funny. We, I think after 2008, for about five minutes, we were mm -hmm. pretty optimistic. And then 2016 came. Good mm -hmm. God. It's almost surreal because it's like literally you're watching these states in the that is big hard on to roll back and undo these laws, civil rights laws that were passed 50 years ago. Why in the world would you want to keep another working tax paying citizen from voting? Folks on board. They, they're tax paying, <laughs> tax paying yeah. citizens, folks to work and you want to deny them the right. But then again, remember Obama's last term, he nominated Merrick Garland for Supreme Court. Yeah. When was the last time the Senate refused to even just even argue the guy's nominee. They basically stole that Supreme Court seat from the black president. Oh yeah, yeah. By refuse yeah. by refusing to see. And the sad thing about Garland, he's not even a liberal. He's really a moderate. He basically right. gave them <laughs> what they would have asked for. But yeah. we are. I, I mean, I feel good about my life. I feel I've done a lot of good things. It ain't even yeah. perfect, but I've done a lot of good things. I've definitely accomplished more than the men in my family before me. But when you look at just overall everything, it's just some, sometimes there are feelings of, is this all in vain? Really, mm. a discussion not too long ago uh, about individuals, the, mm -hmm. the wisdom of those individuals who choose to be deadbeats. I mean, not when it comes to kids, but I'm talking about they don't work. They just oh. want to. They just want to live on public and say, "Oh, that's horrible." But what do you think about it? When mm -hmm. you really think about it. I mean, <laughs> maybe they're smarter than all of us. We out here laboring, busting our tails to the very end, and look what do we get? Yeah. Like we not only have we built the nation, dang, we saved it. I think you're right in that. You know, I would argue that some of those struggle with their why and going, well, what, what would this mean to someone else? Um, yeah. And they probably ask it so much so that it prevents them from moving forward or moving to the side or moving anywhere because it's like. I can't, I can't get this answer. No one has it for me. So for that, I sit still. And that is their why. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, none, none of us are going to leave here with all our questions answered, I don't think. No, I won't. I'm going to yeah. do my best to, to get but, educated and, and, and innovative in thought, but I, I doubt. <laughs> and, and a lot of stuff around us, it just doesn't, it doesn't even make sense, you know? It's just... Not just politically, socially, but just, it's just, I don't know. And I think for a lot, of, but it makes, I understand more and more nowadays, mm -hmm. growing up, a lot of the older black men, my family that were around and everything, they just set out all day and just take it in. Yeah. They just, it is what it is. Right. And that was, they just accepted that. And then, right. But then you think about what was it, Robert? Kennedy said what? Uh, no, Edward Kennedy said this at Robert Kennedy's eulogy when he eulogized his brother after he got okay. shot and killed. He said, some men 
see that the way things are and ask why, mm -hmm. my brother saw what could be and asked why not. Okay. And I think yeah. that I'm trying to hang on to the why not. Right. But I feel the why just pulling. Right. I feel it. It's 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 almost surreal. <laughs> it's almost and surreal. This kind of be my final question. <laughs> Of what is the legacy you seek to leave as a black um, artist? As a black artist. Like what's what does that look like for you? Um I, I, rather I, you hang up the, you know, hang up the the, the knife and, and mm -hmm. the art and all of that behind you and everything around you begins to yeah. find a place. What is the legacy? I would hope my legacy honestly would be like that it kind of opened a door and inspired a lot of other black artists, mostly self-taught from non-conventional backgrounds without the formal art education, but just a passion for creating to go for it. You know, it's an honor to have a, a work of mine in a Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in, here in Kansas, in a major museum. I mean, they got one they purchased last fall, last spring. Oh, wow. For their, and it's in there. I mean, right down the hall from uh, 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 Franz Klein, the Kooning, Jackson Pollock is literally right there with the other oh, wow. contemporaries. That's beautiful. But and I and it's beautiful, especially from where I came from. Right. You know, right. You look at everything. And so my hope is that, you know, maybe just the things I'm doing will make it easier for the next artist who comes along hopefully leave the world in a, a better place. I think art, even if it's not sold, even if it's not hung, I think the very act of creating it is a statement. Oh yeah. When, when you look at everything that has affected us as a people, choosing to be a, an agent of creativity rather than an agent of destruction is a statement. And so I would just hope that, uh, I just hope it would help inspire somebody else, really. Yeah. And, yeah. and and many others, and the, and the, the narratives and stories will be told. I've met many of young men along my journey, and let's just say the amount, the overwhelming response I got from just sharing our part one interview, the appreciation the generation, the younger generation had for your work and for your stories, I thought was very unique because I often wonder, who do, hmm, who do the new black man, so the, the, the black man of today, um, as he comes into his own, who does he have to talk to? Who is to mentor him? Who educates him on, uh, I don't know, the legacy before him, his ancestors? Who has those stories to tell? I hope that whatever role I play in all of this, that I'm getting um, you, Harold, out into the world, into the hands and hearts of men who would, would never, not even, wouldn't even ask for, wouldn't even know what to ask for, um, can get just a piece of what you have to offer to the world. Um, just to know your art exists, just to know that the creation of, um, and your, your lens of what is a Black man, that it touches them, that it, that it sparks something in them, that it says, you know, you belong here, you exist, you matter. You know, along the path of everything else going on, um, and even for a moment in time, they can go, take a breath of like just to breathe a little bit and you know that someone sees them someone's creating for them someone is telling the stories that are untold of their ancestors and of the people that they never got a chance to experience that shares the same stories as them right. so and then yeah. and, and their so, stories i, I thank you I, I know that we ran over and i apologize for keeping okay. you so long i told you i told right. you we would be on here depending on how it would go um i can appreciate the stories um not having the opportunity to talk to many men um, of your generation, knowing what I know because I sought it out, not because it was given to me, um, the patience you provided um, in sharing your stories to someone such as me, um, who our journeys may have been very different, but I have an appreciation for all of what you've done, everything from in the barbershop <laughs> yeah. uh, to your work being in a library, a place where I enjoy. Yeah, and just your love and appreciation for music and what that's been for you. Picking at picking at your thought process as you think of the invisible, the man, the complexities of a black man, and that the black man, the story must be told. And right. if it's if it is on the canvas, yes, I'll right. take that any day because it, it helps to have a different conversation. 
and a collective conversation. So yes. I thank you. I thank you for, for this thank moment. You. <laughs>